Hey folks, this is JR with DIY Prepper. Welcome to the channel. As preppers, there's a lot of skills that we know that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to be able to preserve our food. We're supposed to be able to purify water, have basic bushcraft and survival skills, and also be able to protect ourselves and our loved ones. But one area that isn't covered all that much is the area of gathering intelligence. And that's important both when things are relatively normal and even more so once things really start to go downhill. Knowing what's happening around you now could make you more aware of potential issues that could crop up once things start to go downhill. And I mean, having good information about your surroundings during a disaster could mean the difference between surviving and not. And when most people think about gathering intelligence, they think about it from a defensive standpoint. And of course, that's extremely important. You need to know if people are looting homes or businesses so that you can mount a defense if that comes your way. And you may also need to learn about an area before you travel through it to avoid danger. But there's a lot more to gathering intel than just the purely defensive aspect of it. For example, you need to know traffic patterns so that you can avoid traffic jams if you're trying to get out of town. You also need to know if water sources you're depending on have become contaminated because people are dumping stuff in them that they shouldn't be. If there's some sort of disease that crops up, you need to know about that so you can take steps to protect you and your loved ones. And also there could be weather situations like an incoming storm you need to know about or if a storm has rendered certain roadways unusable. Probably one of the best ways to gather intel both now and during a disaster is to just talk talk to your neighbors. There's a very good chance that they've seen or heard something that you have not and talking to them can make you aware of that. That's something we've experienced in our neighborhood with some of the situations we've been dealing with. But you want to be very careful who you talk to because some neighbors like to embellish things or just make stuff up. If possible, try to find out if you have folks with a criminal history living around you. While you may not be able to find out everything, online databases make it fairly easy to discover if you have certain kinds of offenders living in your neighborhood. Try to be aware of any crime hotspots that are in your town because there's a very good chance that if things are bad in a certain area now, they're only going to get way worse if things start to go downhill. Online community forums are another good resource to use. Where I live, they use nextdoor.com a lot, and that's used just to discuss upcoming community events, but also to talk about if there's crime happening in the area or if there's suspicious people walking around. If you have something like a doorbell camera or a security system, then you may have access to a similar service through that. If you have friends that work in law enforcement, they could be valuable sources of information. While they may not be able to tell you everything, there's a good chance that you can probably learn something that you didn't know before. You may still be able to use a police scanner to keep track of what emergency services are doing in your area, but many agencies are now using encrypted digital communications. But even if you don't have like a dedicated police scanner, you can use things like the police scanner app to see what emergency services in your area are doing. Sometimes if I hear a bunch of sirens, going on. I'll turn on that app to try to find out something. Honestly, I haven't had all that much luck, but it could be useful in certain situations. The problem with using that app is since it's through your cell phone, you're going to have to have internet access either through Wi-Fi or your cellular network, and of course you're going to have to keep your phone up and running. Also, another thing you want to do if you're going to be using that is check and make sure that you can actually pick up agencies in your area because you don't want to think that, hey, it's going to work, and then you pull it out to use it, and it doesn't. But one of the best ways to know what's going on around you during different kinds of situations is to use a radio. But if you're going to be using radios, you need to know the advantages and disadvantages of each kind. Now, the advantage to pretty much any radio is going to be that it doesn't rely on large-scale infrastructure to operate. As long as you have two radios that are operational, they're on the same frequency, and they're within range of one another, as long as they can transmit, then you can use them to communicate with one another. Emergency radios like this one are good during short-term emergencies or the opening stages of a long-term disaster. You'll be able to get information for as long as radio stations are broadcasting, and you can keep the radio powered up. But it's important to understand that once AM, FM, and NOAA stations are offline, then you're not going to be able to get information from those and emergency radios, generally speaking, they are not able to transmit. FRS radios like these are designed for short range two way communication and they're what most people think of when they think of walkie talkies. These work very well if you want to communicate with nearby neighbors, say there's an older couple living in your neighborhood and you want to be able to check on them from time to time, they're very good for that. 
Also, if you have some acreage and you want to communicate with maybe a family member or another member of your group from one side of that property to the other, they can be useful for that as well. Just be aware that those kind of radios, they aren't very secure at all. So that's something that you want to be aware of since people could use um, a radio just like yours or very similar to intercept your communications. GMRS radios are a big step up in power and they can be used to communicate over longer distances than FRS radios. And when it comes to range, if you have something like a base station or a mobile setup in your car, you can realistically expect to probably get at least a couple of miles of range out of them. You also have access to more frequencies, although you can also communicate on some FRS frequencies as well. The main downside to them is that in order to use them while society is up and running, you need to pay $35 for a license but you don't have to pay for an exam like you do for ham radio. And speaking of ham radio, it really is the cream of the crop if you want to communicate over long distances during a long-term disaster. Even with, you know, some handheld units, if somebody has a powerful enough transmitter, then you can pick up their communication. So they're very good ways to both send and receive that information. But of course, the more powerful the setup, the more money it's going to cost and the more energy that it's going to need. Also, with a ham radio, you are going to need a license, so you're going to have to pay that $35 fee. I think they lowered it last year, and you're going to have to take an exam for that. Uh, now, of course, that's when society's still up and running. We all know that, but going ahead and getting that license and going through the training that you would need to pass that test, it is a good way to familiarize yourself with a more powerful, complex radio system. Now, if you're trying to gather intel on foot, there's a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. If you're just trying to gather general information, then maybe joining something like a food handout line might be a good idea. You'll be able to talk to people, find out what they know, and it might kind of also throw them off your scent so that if they see you in that line, instead of hold up in your house all the time, they might think that you're in the same situation that they are and not come knocking on your door looking for supplies. But of course, if you do that, you want to blend in as much as possible and not look like you're way better off than everybody else. Also, don't forget that you have a valuable intel gathering tool probably just feet from you and you may actually be watching it now. Cell phones are good for taking high res pictures, HD video, recording sound, and those functions, they're going to continue to work long after things like cellular networks and Wi-Fi are completely gone. Even if you have a small solar setup, you'll be able to keep a phone charged pretty much indefinitely. One thing I've used mine for is we had this suspicious guy wandering around people's houses and looks like he was casing the place, to be honest with you. And I just went for a walk. I had the camera on on my phone. Uh, turn off the sound if you do this, but I just let my phone kind of swing down by my side and I hit the volume button and I was taking just tons and tons of pictures. Now, none of them were aimed or anything like that, but you take like 50 pictures in rapid succession, there's a good chance that you're going to get at least a halfway decent one of somebody's face. So that, that's something you can do. You might also want to dim the screen and be sure it is the back facing camera doing that and the screen is facing away from the person so they can't really tell what you're up to. And y'all, it should go without saying, but you want to avoid danger as much as possible. While there may be times where you have to take some risks, there are certain elements of gathering intelligence and certain tasks associated with that that are best done by somebody with military training in that. So it's a very good idea to have somebody in your group that has that sort of experience. But there are some best practices that you want to follow even if you think what you're doing is relatively safe. Having a decent pair of binoculars will allow you to check out an area from a distance before you go in. But the thing with binoculars is that you're going to have to balance power and size. The small ones, they're nice, they're portable, they can fit in a pocket but they're really not going to magnify all that much just because the lenses aren't big enough. But if you have a larger pair of binoculars that can really do a good job magnifying things, then it's going to take up a whole lot of space in a pack. Spotting scopes work really well for home use. You can set them up outside to keep track of maybe some remote areas of your property or beyond your property. And if you have a two-story house, you can set up what's called a room hide to use a spotting scope to do surveillance. It's kind of hard to find information about that online, and I don't really have a room in my house with enough free space to set one up. But if you want to learn more about how to set up a room hide, you can find that in the book 100 Deadly Skills. It basically uses 
a lot of like, you know, black like curtains or bed sheets or something like that to set up a little room within your room to make it very difficult to, to determine if somebody is in that room or not. Drones are another tool that you could use to gather intel from a distance. They allow you to get a bird's eye view of an area, which could be useful if you're trying to keep track of a potential threat or scouting an area before you travel through it. Having a drone will allow you to find out the info that you need while reducing the amount of danger that you put yourself in. Some drones can even carry and drop small payloads, and there's a lot of different uses for that. One of them would be if somebody's injured and they're going to take a little while to get to, then you can fly them some first aid supplies where if they're able to, they can kind of treat themselves before help arrives. But just be aware that launching and landing a drone can give away your position. If somebody wants to know who's flying a drone, all they really have to do is see it when it's taking off or wait for it to land and in that sort of situation you definitely want to be aware of that so you can move away from that area quickly. Regardless of the method that you're using to gather intel be sure that you have multiple ways that you can get out of that area. Have more than one pre-planned exit route that you can use and also be aware of potential hiding spots so that you can be aware where people might be hanging out if they want to cut you off but also if there's a situation where you need to kind of duck down for a little while then you can use those. If you're looking for a quick way to get out of an area that doesn't make a whole lot of sound then an e-bike could be a good option but of course you're going to need a way to keep that charged up long term. If you want to learn more about some off-grid power options that you could use to power something like that go ahead and click here and if you want to learn more just about general home security click on this video thank y'all for stopping by y'all have a good one